Dear students, we will move to the next topic under the major topic that you are seeing that is the union legislature. So, we have taken the topic union legislature couple of classes before and we have covered some of the topics like what is the composition, what is the constitution and then we have also seen as to how the election happens to both the houses of the parliament. So, as we will proceed and we also understood the qualification and the disqualification of the members of the parliament. So, we will proceed to the next topic that is the presiding officers. So, who are the presiding officers in the houses of the parliament? In fact, both the houses have got their respect to presiding officers and in fact, the presiding officer in case of the Lok Sabha who is a speaker has been given the high order of presidents. And you know, in ways, in case of the presiding officer for the Rajya Sabha is none other than the vice president himself. The vice president is ex officio chairman of the Rajya Sabha. And both the vice president and the speaker has been given high order of presidents among the various officials in our country. And that signifies what is the important position that the presiding officers have to play in our country, in our parliamentary system. So, in today's lecture, we will try to understand broadly as to what are the powers and functions of the presiding officer, whether they get elected or whether they get nominated and what are the functions they are supposed to perform under the constitution. So, we will move to the next lecture that is lecture number 90 in our series of discussion that is Indian polity by M. Lakshmikant. So, we will quickly move to the next part that is a speaker. We will try to understand the various provisions under the constitution with regard to the presiding officers. Now, if you see the presiding officers as I already said the presiding officer in case of Lok Sabha it is the speaker and for the Rajya Sabha it is the vice president. The vice president becomes the ex officio chairman of Rajya Sabha. So, first we will try to understand the speaker of Lok Sabha, his powers and functions and other constitutional provisions and then the presiding officer, the speaker also has its own deputy. So, there is also a post of deputy speaker. So, once we complete that, then we will move on to the chairman and the deputy chairman in case of the Rajya Sabha. So, what does the constitution say with regard to the speaker? The speaker is the presiding officer of the Lok Sabha. And in fact, under the constitution of India, the speaker is someone who is elected from among the members of that particular house. That means the basic condition, the eligibility criteria as to one to become the speaker of the house is that he should be a member of that particular house. Only if he is a member of that particular house, please understand, only if he is a member of that particular house, he can become the speaker. And only if he is a member and if he gets elected after the election and basically this election is decided. Uh, it is conducted on a date which is decided by the president of India. So, the elections will happen after the new Lok Sabha election is over and then the new speaker will be elected and the speaker has to be elected by what is called as the simple majority in the house. We will discuss all those things, but before we understand all those things, we will have to understand something about the office of what is called as a speaker pro tem. Although there is no mention of this officer that is mention of this particular office that is speaker pro tem in the constitution, but as a convention that we follow this particular system and by convention the house also has someone who is called as the speaker pro tem. So, who exactly is the speaker pro tem? And to understand the speaker pro tem, you will have to understand that uh, now we are about to have our Lok Sabha elections. In 2024, the Lok Sabha elections will happen. Now, understand Mr. Om Brilla is the Lok Sabha speaker presently for the 17th Lok Sabha. And before the elections, the Lok Sabha will be dissolved. We all know that it has to be dissolved and then only there can be elections to the new Lok Sabha. Now, under the constitution of India, even if the Lok Sabha is dissolved, the speaker would continue to hold the office. The speaker will not demit his office. And the speaker would continue to hold the office till the time after the election to the new Lok Sabha is over. Somebody is appointed as the speaker pro term. So, please understand the speaker pro term is not someone who is elected. The speaker pro term is someone who is appointed. And who appoints the speaker pro tem? The speaker pro tem is appointed by the president of India. And the speaker pro tem is someone who is a member of the Lok Sabha, who is elected to the new Lok Sabha and by parliamentary convention, usually a senior most person, usually a senior most person, not necessarily, but it is just a convention, usually a senior most member of parliament in Lok Sabha is appointed as the speaker pro tem by the president of India. And usually he is from the ruling party, whichever party has the majority 
So from that particular party, usually a senior most person is appointed as a speaker pro tem. When I say senior most person, not in terms of his age, but in terms of how many times he got elected as a member of parliament to Lok Sabha. Now, what is the purpose that there is someone who is called as a speaker pro tem? Because please understand, the house has to elect a new speaker. And for the house to elect a new speaker, the members of the parliament has to vote in that particular house. But as per the constitution of India, the newly elected members has to be administered oath as a member of parliament. And only after administering the oath, then only they can take part in the voting. And for this particular thing, the oath has to be administered. And who is going to administer this oath? So that will be majorly done by someone who is called as the speaker pro tem. And for the, this particular purpose, the speaker pro tem is appointed by the president. The moment the speaker pro tem appoints, the term of the previous speaker comes to an end. So that means in the 18th Lok Sabha, so presently we are in 17th Lok Sabha. In the 18th Lok Sabha, when the Lok Sabha elections are over, when the members of parliament comes to the Lok Sabha and in that particular house, in the 18th Lok Sabha, when the president will appoint somebody as a speaker pro tem, then Mr. Om Brilla cease to be a speaker. So his term comes to an end. Now, the speaker pro tem, what he will do, then he will administer oath to all the members of the parliament. And only after the oath is administered, then they can take part in the elections. Once a speaker pro tem is appointed and the speaker pro tem administers oath to all the members of the parliament in the Lok Sabha, then the president will come and the president will decide a date on which the election of the speaker is to happen. So, the date will be decided for whom? For the election of the speaker. And the election of the speaker will happen. And in the election of the speaker, who can participate in the election? Usually a person who is only a member of parliament from Lok Sabha can contest election. And then all the members in the Lok Sabha will vote. And who is chosen as a speaker? Whoever is elected by simple majority. So normally it is only the ruling party or who will be able to form the government. So only they will have the majority. So there is uh, very clear that usually the speaker will be from what? The speaker is from the ruling party. Now, take the example of Mr. Om Rilla. So, Mr. Om Rilla is from what? He is from the ruling party, he is from the BJP party. So, he is appointed as, he is rather elected as the speaker. Now, once a speaker is elected, then there is no role of the speaker pro tem and the office of the speaker pro tem automatically cease to exist. So, this is the basic idea you should have as to what is the role of the speaker pro tem. It is only that in interim he is appointed till the time the new speaker is elected and basically he administers both. And he also conducts the election. The date is decided by the president. The election to the office of the speaker is decided by, sorry, it is decided by president and it is conducted by the speaker pro tem. Once a new speaker elected, he automatically ceases to exist. Then what would be the tenure of the new speaker who is elected? The tenure of the new speaker who is elected, it continues to be, it continues till the time that the speaker pro tem is appointed in the new Lok Sabha. So till that point of time, he continues to exist. At any point of time, he can resign from his office. So, he can resign from submitting his resignation to the deputy speaker. So, deputy speaker, he can resign at any time. And then, he can also be disqualified. He can also be disqualified. That is, the speaker can be disqualified similar to that of the members of parliament. So, we already seen that a lot of grounds on which a members of parliament can be disqualified. So, on the same grounds, he can also be disqualified. Now, please understand, once he is disqualified to be a member of parliament, then he cannot continue to be in the office of the speaker. Because what is the primary condition under the constitution? Only a member of parliament can be in the Lok Sabha, can be a speaker. So once he is disqualified, he cannot continue to be the speaker. And apart from that, the speaker can also be removed from his office by a motion passed in the Lok Sabha by what is called as effective majority. That means if a particular person is introducing a proposal to remove the speaker and if that particular motion is introduced by what is called as effective majority, if it is introduced and if it is passed by effective majority, then the speaker will be removed from his office. Now, what is this effective majority? We already discussed all those things. The effective majority is the majority of the then members in the house or in other words, effective majority is the majority of the effective membership of the house. And how do you calculate the effective membership? So, this is the formula that you calculate the effective membership. So, effective membership is equal to total membership of the house, total membership minus vacancies in the house. So, whatever is that we are getting is what is called as the effective membership. 
and the majority of effective membership is what is called as the effective majority. So, this is basically what you will have to understand. So, this is exactly what you have to understand with regard to the presiding officer. Okay. So, try to understand uh, these are the basic things that you should have in your mind. But the presiding officer under the constitution has a very important role to play. And in fact, uh, he is the one who has to maintain the decorum of the house. And in order to maintain the discipline, decorum, and to carry forward various proceedings in the Lok Sabha, the presiding officer has been given enormous powers under the constitution. And he is supposed to perform a lot of functions under the constitution. So, what are the powers and the functions that the presiding officer is supposed to perform? So, that is exactly what we are going to understand. So, let us proceed further and let us try to understand that. Before I proceed further, you can see that Study IQ has launched its uh, prelims to interview online batches, that is the prelims to interview batches, which would be an online batch for the month of August. And uh, the batches are starting from 23rd of August and this time the batches would be evening batches. So, all the batches will start at 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. that is the timing of these courses. And the courses are launched in all the three languages, English, English and also in the Hindi languages. And students who are interested in taking the admissions, so they can take it before 23rd of August. And if you want an additional discount on any of these courses, not only the prelims to interview batches, but also any of the courses that is offered by Study IQ. So, you, you can get an extra discount if you can use my code BABULAI. All right. So, we will proceed further. We will try to understand as to what are the powers and functions of the speaker. So, if you see the powers and functions of the speaker, you will understand that what is the major function of the speaker is that he has to maintain the order and decorum in the house. So, that is exactly what he has to maintain. He has to maintain the order and decorum in the house. That means he has to ensure the discipline in the house. So, that is basically what does it mean by the order and the decorum in the house. So, basically this is something that he has to ensure and uh, in order to maintain the decorum in the house and to discipline the members, if somebody is engaged in indisciplinary activities, the speaker is also empowered to make rules for the Lok Sabha and as per the rules, the speaker can punish the individuals. So, sometimes uh, he can adjourn the houses, sometimes he can initiate disciplinary action against the members of the parliament, he can suspend the members of the parliament on a temporary basis. So, all these things can be done by the speaker. Next thing, the speaker also has the power to adjourn the house when there is lack of quorum in the house. So, constitutionally, the speaker is supposed to carry out the functions. So, transact, the speaker is the one who has to allow the members of the parliament to transact various business in the house, be it a discussion in the house, be it introducing a bills in the house, be it voting on the various proposals in the house. Now, it is for the speaker to allow for that. So, when the speaker is supposed to allow for such proposals to happen in the house, only when there is a quorum in the house. So, what does it mean by quorum in the house? So, quorum means that there is a need for minimum number of members to be present in the house. So, what is the minimum number of members to be present in the house? The minimum number of members to be present in the house as per the constitution is not less than one-tenth of the total membership of the house. So, this is exactly what you will have to understand. So, it should be one-tenth of the total membership of the house. That is exactly what is called as a quorum. But however, the constitution says the parliament can make a law and by that law they can change as to what constitutes quorum. But however, no such law has been made by the parliament. So, actually what constitutes quorum as per the constitution today is it should not be less than one-tenth of the total membership of the house. And then, who is the final authority? In fact, it is a speaker who is a final authority to interpret the rules within the house. So, if there is any confusion with regard to interpretation of any of the rules in the house, so who is the final authority to interpret those rules? Now, take the example of the constitution of India. Who is the final authority to interpret the constitution of India? The final authority to interpret the constitution of India is the Supreme Court. And similarly, who is the final authority to interpret the rules within the house? To interpret the rules within the house, it is the speaker who is the final authority. All right. And he also has a power to preside over what is called as the joint sittings. Now, what do you mean by joint sitting? Normally, the members of the parliament, they transact their business separately in their respective houses. The Lok Sabha will transact its business in the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha will transact its business in the Rajya Sabha. But however, we also know that if a bill is to become an act, suppose if the bill is passed in the Lok Sabha, let us assume Lok Sabha is where the bill is introduced. 
it has to be passed by Lok Sabha, it has to come to Rajya Sabha, which is the second house. Now, once it is passed by Lok Sabha, it comes to Rajya Sabha. Once it is approved by both the houses, please understand, once it is approved by both the houses, then it goes to the president for his assent. So, then the president gives the assent to the bill, it becomes what is called as an act. But it might be possible that uh, the Lok Sabha has approved it, it has gone to the Rajya Sabha and the Rajya Sabha is not agreeing to it. Or it can be vice versa that the Rajya Sabha has approved the bill, it has gone to the Lok Sabha and the Lok Sabha is not approving it. Now, if a bill is to become an act, we know that it has to be approved by both the houses of the parliament. And if they are not on the same page, if there are differences of opinion between the houses, or one house is suggesting certain amendments and the other house is not accepting to it. In all these cases, the bill has reached a stage which is what is called as deadlock. They have reached a stage what is called as deadlock. And uh, when there is a deadlock means that the bill has reached a stage where the bill cannot move forward. But however, under the constitution, there is a way by which this deadlock can also be resolved. The president has a power to convene a joint sitting under article 108. Under article 108, who has the power to call for a joint sitting? The president has the power to call for a joint sitting. The president can call for a joint sitting. And what does it mean by joint sitting? In a joint sitting, the president can call upon both the mem members of both houses to sit together and to collectively decide upon this particular proposal. Although the president has a power to convene a joint sitting, who can preside over this joint sitting? That is something that you have to understand. So, it is only the speaker who has a power to preside over the joint sitting. In the absence of the speaker, the deputy speaker can also preside over it. In the absence of both the speaker and the deputy speaker, then the deputy chairman of Rajya Sabha can preside over it. But no way that the, the chairman of Rajya Sabha can preside over it. And I am repeating this again, very, very important, you can remember this. So, whenever a joint sitting is convened by the president, who has the power to preside over that? The speaker will have the power to preside over that. And then after the speaker who will preside over that, it will be presided over by the deputy speaker, in case if the speaker is not there. If both are not there, then it is a deputy chairman of Rajya Sabha who will preside over this. Okay. So, this is exactly what you will have to understand. And uh, then if you see, it is also the speaker who has the power to certify a bill as a money bill. While the speaker does that under Article 108. So, basically under Article 108, the president can convene a joint setting and once it is convened, then the speaker can preside over the house. And it is also the speaker who can certify a bill as a money bill. So, do not uh, worry as to what is a money bill at this stage. So, as I will proceed further, when I take up the different types of bills, I will make you with precise clarity as to what does it mean by a money bill. But right now, I understand that what is a money bill? A money bill is something which involves the important matters of finances of the government, be it expenditure or be it revenue, mostly from the Consolidated Fund of India. So, if a bill involves these provisions, if the bill involves these subject matters, and then it can be considered what is called as a money bill. But however, who can certify a bill as a money bill? It is only the uh, speaker who has the power to certify a particular bill as a money bill under Article 110 of the Constitution. Okay, so try to remember this as well. And apart from that, uh, it is also the power of the speaker to disqualify the members of the parliament from Lok Sabha on the grounds of anti-defection law. Apart from the anti-defection law, we also see number of grounds for disqualification of the members of the parliament. In all other grounds, who will be the disqualifying authority? It is the President of India who will be the disqualifying authority on the recommendation of the Election Commission of India. But when it comes to anti-defection law, who is the disqualifying authority? When it comes to anti-defection law, the disqualifying authority is the President of India. So, the President can disqualify them. Okay. So, that is basically what you will have to understand. So, here the disqualifying authority is the President, which happens under what? Which is uh, the power which is given to the uh, Speaker under Article 102 as well as from the 10th Schedule of the Constitution. From the 10th Schedule of the Constitution. All right. And then apart from that, if you look into the voting power of the Speaker, the Speaker does not normally vote in first instance. In order to ensure the independence of the Speaker and the impartiality of the Speaker, he does not vote in the first instance, but he votes in case of a tie or in case of what is called as equality of votes. So, to break the tie in case if a proposal is put to vote, and the number of votes for and against the vote is the same, then the speaker may exercise this vote. And that is what is called as casting vote. That is especially to break the tie. So, this power is there with the speaker. 
Apart from that, it is also the speaker who will appoint the chairman of various committees in the Lok Sabha. As we will proceed uh, at the end stages of this union legislature, we will also deal with a topic which is called as the parliamentary committees. In the parliamentary committees, you will understand that there are a number of committees within the parliament. And what is basically the function of these parliamentary committees? These committees will aid and these committees will help the parliament in discharging their duties and functions effectively. So, that is basically what is called as the parliamentary committees. Now, who will help the parliament is these parliamentary committees, but who will appoint the members and the chairperson of these parliamentary committees within the Lok Sabha? It is a speaker who will appoint them. But however, one speciality is that the speaker himself is a chairperson of certain committees. So, the speaker himself is a chairperson of the rules committee. The speaker himself is a chairperson of business advisory committee and the general purpose committee. So, as of now, try to remember these committees because each and every committee in the parliament, they have a specific function to perform. So, what is their functions that I will discuss a little later. But as of now, just try to remember, but uh, as that with regard to these committees, the speaker has a predominant role to play in terms of appointment of the members and also he himself is a chairperson of these committees. Alright, so these are majorly the powers and functions, majorly that what the speaker is supposed to perform. And it is very important that under the constitution and under our parliamentary system, the speaker performs or the speaker is independent and he also performs his duties in an impartial manner. When I say that the speaker performs his duties and functions in an impartial manner, now under the constitution of India, there is no requirement for the speaker to resign from his political party once he is elected as a speaker. In fact, take the example of Mr. Om Brilla. Mr. Om Brilla now continues to be a member of BJP party, but still he is elected as the speaker. And if you see the speaker has the power to give permission to the members to raise a question, the speaker can take disciplinary actions. The speaker has the power to disqualify the members on the grounds of disqualification. The speaker has the power to certify a bill as a money bill. So, number of powers are interested upon the speaker and if the speaker is going to misuse these powers, then he can silence the opposition and then he can favor the government in the parliament, which he is not supposed to do as per the oath that he takes. But however, what if the speaker misuses or what if the speaker is forced to do, do all these things. And that is why the constant assembly has also taken certain measures and provided certain provisions that would ensure the independence and impartiality of the speaker. So, although the speaker continues to be a member of a particular political party, how the speaker can still function independently and impartially if he wanted to remain independently and impartially. So, certain provisions are given in the constitution. So, that is exactly what we are going to understand. So, what are the provisions that makes the speaker independent and impartial? So, here we can understand that the speaker has been given a security of tenure. The speaker is not given a fixed term, although he continues to hold the office once he is elected as a speaker till the time the Lok Sabha is dissolved and even after that till the time the speaker pro tem is appointed. But the speaker can be removed from his office any point of time. He can be disqualified also. He can be removed also. But however, see the majority that is required to remove the speaker. The majority that is required to remove the speaker is effective majority. It is not very difficult to achieve effective majority even by the government. Although they may have a simple majority, but they may not have an effective majority. While the speaker is elected by a simple majority, but for his removal, the majority that is required is effective majority. That means the idea is by making the removal of the speaker difficult, the members of the constant assembly wanted to make sure that that will allow the speaker to function independently and impartially. And then the salaries and allowances of the speaker are to be charged upon the Consolidated Fund of India. So, do not worry as to what is the charge expenditure. If you see the Consolidated Fund of India, which is like the bank account for the government from where they take the money for all the expenditure and all the revenue will also get credited into the Consolidated Fund of India. So, this is where the revenue gets in of the government and this is where they take out money from the expenditure. And if you see the expenditure of the government, which is further classified into made expenditure and charge expenditure. So, what is the difference between made expenditure and the charge expenditure? If you see the differences, that for the made expenditure, it requires the approval of the parliament. But for the charge expenditure, it does not even require the approval of the parliament. 
it is not put to vote in the form of demand for grants which i'll subsequently explain when i take up the budget part but as of now you can understand the charge expenditure is something that the parliament does not have much control but if it is a made expenditure the parliament has a lot of control over those things so that's exactly what you'll have to understand so here you can see that the salary and allowances are charged on the consolidated fund of india so that means the parliament cannot even reduce the salary of the speaker the next thing is not to be questioned in a court of law regarding the proceedings in the houses when i say it is not to be questioned in the court of law with regard to the proceedings in the houses it only means whatever happens in the house please understand whatever happens in the house it is for the speaker to decide because he is the presiding officer of the house the court cannot inquire as to why this has been done why this procedure has not been followed or why this procedure has been followed it is for the presiding officer to determine all those things all right and that power is given to the by the to the presiding officer under article 122 of the constitution and then he will vote only in case of tie so this power is also given because he does not vote in the first instance in favor of the government because he is still belonging to the political party which has formed the government so this power has been taken away to him that he shall not vote in the first instance but however please understand he can vote when he can vote he can vote when that there is a tie and to break the tie he can vote and then there is a very high order of precedence that is given to him so his order of precedence is equal to that of the chief justice of india so in the order of precedence he is ranking seventh along with the chief justice of india so this shows what is the importance that has been given to the office of the speaker and the functions that is to be carried out by the speaker so all those things are trying to uh, maintain his independence and impartiality and the constituent assembly members are also thought about what if the speaker is not present on a given day or what if the speaker office becomes suddenly vacant so in order to deal with this situation the constitution is also provided for what is called as the office of the deputy speaker so what is the function that is to be performed by the office of the deputy speaker the office of the deputy speaker does not have any function as long as a speaker is there but if the speaker is not there then the deputy speaker will perform all the functions as that of the speaker and he'll have all the privileges as that of the speaker in case if the speaker is absent or if the office of the speaker becomes vacant till the time the new speaker is elected so that is the role of the deputy speaker but however under the constitution please understand that the speaker also is elect sorry the deputy speaker is also elected and he should also be among the members so what is the basic condition to elect the deputy speaker please understand he should be a member of that particular house if he is not a member of that particular house he cannot be elected in the first place only a member of the house can be elected as the deputy speaker as well and once he is elected he will be there for the term of the house okay so that is what is about the deputy speaker the deputy speaker is also elected by what majority he is also elected by simple majority he is elected by simple majority and then he can also be disqualified on the same grounds as that of the other members of the parliament he can be removed from his office by a resolution passed in the house by effective majority and he can also resign from his office at any time by submitting his resignation to the speaker to the speaker he can submit the resignation so it is vice versa okay so they can submit the resignation and they may resign from their office so these are all the basic conditions that is given in the constitution and as i already said what is the function that he is supposed to perform he has no specific function that is supposed to be performed but normally what he does is that he is just like another member of parliament as long as a speaker is there but if the speaker is not there then he occupies the office of the speaker so this is majorly what the deputy speaker is supposed to do but there is one privilege to the deputy speaker so what is the privilege that the deputy speaker exercise and enjoy if suppose the deputy speaker is appointed as a member of any of the committee i already said in the parliament there can be number of committees so if suppose he is appointed as the deputy speaker so he is appointed as a member of any of the committee the deputy speaker then he automatically becomes the chairman of that particular committee so that's a basic idea you should have so he automatically becomes the chairman of that particular committee he not only becomes so he has to be the chairman of that particular committee provided that the speaker is not a member of that particular house if the speaker is there then obviously then the deputy speaker cannot be the chairperson but the speaker is only part of three committees we already seen and for all the three committees he is a chairperson 
and suppose if the deputy speaker is part of any of the committee apart from these things the deputy speaker automatically becomes the chairperson of that particular committee and now the question is the deputy speaker comes from which party is he from the ruling party or is he from the opposition party because all that required to elect someone as the speaker is it requires simple majority that means this simple majority is available only for the government and not for the opposition the opposition does not have the majority and that's why they are opposition so from which party the deputy speaker will be elected although the constitution does not say anything with regard to the office of the speaker and the deputy speaker as to from which party they have to come the constitution only says that whoever is elected as speaker and the deputy speaker they should have simple majority or they should be elected by simple majority so with regard to speaker normally it is from the ruling party but with regard to the deputy speaker a convention has been followed and this convention has been followed from the 11th lok sabha and what is a convention that is followed right now in our country that the opposition will not contest sorry the ruling party will not contest for the post of deputy speaker and they will give it to the opposition parties so that is exactly what has been followed as a convention but however both in the 16th and the 17th lok sabha presently the post of deputy speaker is vacant now why the post of deputy speaker is vacant because the bjp party is not recognizing the congress as the opposition party now why the congress is not recognized as the opposition party because as per the directions which is given by the presiding officers as per the rules of the house an opposition party is something that which has got not less than one tenth of the total membership of the house that means they should have minimum of 55 members in the house which congress is not having in the lok sabha neither congress nor any of the other party is having it so bjp is saying that we are not officially recognizing any party as a opposition party and hence there is no deputy speaker but normally it goes to the post of deputy speaker goes to the opposition party so these are the basic information now all these things may be asked in your prelims examination the powers and functions of the speaker can be asked in the mains examination as well all right so now we'll move to the chairman and the deputy chairman of rajya sabha but before that there is also something which is called as the panel of chairpersons of lok sabha so what does it mean by the panel of chairperson so the speaker is there then you have the deputy speaker so what the speaker will do is that he will appoint a panel of chairpersons not more than 10 people 10 mps in the lok sabha and they will be designated as the panel of chairpersons so the idea of appointing this panel of chairpersons is that when the speaker is not there when the speaker is uh, deputy speaker is also not there when i say they are not there they are absent in the house so when the speaker is absent when the deputy speaker is absent then anyone among the panel of chairpersons can preside over the house and if nobody in the channel of chairpersons are also available then in the absence of all these people then the house may decide anyone to preside over the house but however this can happen only in case of absence of these people but if there is a vacancy to the office of the speaker and the deputy speaker then the president can appoint anyone as the speaker temporarily the president can ask anyone to preside over the house temporarily till the time the new speaker is elected okay so this is basically you will have to understand as to what is given in the constitution now come to the next thing that is a chairman of rajya sabha who is also the presiding officer of the rajya sabha now the presiding officer of lok sabha is the speaker and the presiding officer of uh, of the rajya sabha is nothing but the chairman of rajya sabha but however there is a difference between the speaker and the chairman rajya sabha in case of speaker the speaker should be a member of parliament in lok sabha and he is elected from among the members of the house but however if you take uh, the chairman of rajya sabha the chairman of rajya sabha is not elected among the members of the house he is not an elected member in the first place he is not elected but rather what has been done rather he is uh, appointed uh, rather he becomes an ex officio chairman when i say ex officio chairman by virtue of being the vice president of india he automatically becomes a chairman of rajya sabha so there is no need for any appointment and he continues to draw the salary as the chairman of rajya sabha because the only function as it has envis envisaged in the constitution of india for the vice president is to act as the chairman of rajya sabha but if the chairman is not there then there is also a post of deputy chairman for the rajya sabha the deputy chairman will preside over the house but then unlike 
the chairman Rajya Sabha, the deputy chairman should be a member of that particular house and he or she should be elected from that particular house. So, these are the basic provisions in the constitution. So, what are the powers and privileges and the functions that are to be supposed to performed by the deputy, by the chairman of Rajya Sabha? Now, please understand that the chairman Rajya Sabha will have the same powers, same privileges and the same functions almost as that of the speaker Lok Sabha. For example, whose responsibility is to ensure the decorum in the house and discipline in the house? It is the responsibility of the chairman to do that. It is the responsibility of the chairman to conduct the proceedings only when there is a quorum. So, here also quorum constitutes not less than one tenth of the members of the house, that means 25 members. Here also it is the chairman who will appoint the chairpersons of various committees in the Rajya Sabha. So, similarly, whatever function that is performed by the speaker and the courts cannot enquire into the proceedings in the house because all these things has to be decided by the chairman Rajya Sabha. So, please understand it is a chairman Rajya Sabha who will perform similar functions, who will take disciplinary actions, who can suspend the members from the Rajya Sabha similar to that of the speaker Lok Sabha. But however, there are few differences with regard to the powers and the nature of functions which is performed by the speaker in relation to that of the chairperson that the chairman Rajya Sabha. The chairman Rajya Sabha does not exercise certain powers which is exercised by the speaker of Lok Sabha. So, what are the powers he does not exercise? So, first thing is he does not have the power to certify many bills. There is no power to certify many bills. There is no power to preside joint sittings. When I say that is no power to certify many bills, you can understand that there is no power to certify many bills. So, who has the power to certify a bill as a many bill? It is only the speaker who has the power to certify a bill as a many bill and the chairman does not have the power to certify a bill as a many bill. And apart from that, who has the power to preside over the joint sitting? And to preside over the joint sitting, it is also again only within the powers of the speaker and it is not within the powers of the chairman Rajya Sabha. Now, except for these two differences, so whatever functions that you have already seen with regard to the speaker, almost all the functions are also performed by the chairman Rajya Sabha. And in case if the chairman Rajya Sabha is not there, then who will preside over the house? It will be presided by the deputy chairman of Rajya Sabha. But however, as I already said, that the deputy chairman of Rajya Sabha should be a member of that particular house. And if he is a member of that particular house, he may be elected. And what is the majority with which he should be elected? He or she should be elected by simple majority in the house. And at any point of time, he can submit his resignation to the chairman Rajya Sabha. And he can also be removed from the house if a motion is passed by an effective majority in the house. So, just now I explained as to what is the effective majority. And he can also be disqualified on all the grounds as that of a member of a parliament. Now, once he is disqualified to be a member of parliament, then he cannot continue to be the member of that particular house. Or he can be a, occupy the post of deputy chairman. So, these are the provisions that you have to understand with regard to the post of the deputy chairman. So, normally, the deputy chairman will be someone who is able to get the majority in the house. So, here there is no convention. It will be given to the opposition party. No. So, whoever is getting the majority, so they will become the deputy chairman of the house. So, these are the provisions that you have to understand. So, the only function of the deputy chairman is to preside over the house when the chairman is not there. And apart from that, you understand that as per the rules, there is also something which is called as a vice chairperson of the panel of vice chairperson in Rajya Sabha. Now, what does it mean by the panel of vice chairperson in the Rajya Sabha? So, it is the chairman Rajya Sabha who will nominate certain MPs within the Rajya Sabha to be part of the panel of vice chairpersons. Now, what is the objective of appointing this panel of vice chairpersons? The objective of appointing this panel of vice chairpersons is that when the chairman is absent on a given day and the deputy chairman is also absent on a given day and in the absence of both of them, any member from the panel of vice chairpersons can preside over the house. If none of the panel of vice chairpersons is also present in the house, then the house can decide anyone to preside over the house. But however, this is in only in case of absence. But if there is vacancy to the office of chairman and deputy chairman, then in that particular case, 
then the president can appoint anyone to preside over the house temporarily till the time the new vice president is elected who will automatically become the chairman of the house okay so this is the basic idea and basic understanding you should have with regard to the presiding officer so the presiding officer has a very important role to play under the constitutional system of india now with this information we'll just go to the end of the class let us try to test the knowledge as to what you have gained in today's class so try to read this particular question and try to answer the best option available in this particular question look into the question consider the following statements statement one in the election for lok sabha or state assembly the winning candidate must guest at least 50 percent of the votes polled to be declared elected so this we have seen in the last class itself what is the manner in which the election happens to the lok sabha how the MPs get elected to the Lok Sabha, the same principle also applied in the state legislative assemblies as well. Okay, so see whether this particular statement is right or wrong. According to the provisions laid down in the constitution, the Lok Sabha speaker post goes to the majority party and the deputy speaker to the opposition. So, which of the statements given above is are incorrect, whether it is one only, two only, both one and two, neither one nor two. So, it is for you to answer this particular question. You can put the answers in the comment box. So, that I will also understand whether you have understood the class and what has been taught. And this is also a way that you can participate, which can also keep me encouraging to provide better services to the students. So, with this, we will end the lecture for today. So, tomorrow we will continue with one more topic within the legislature, which deals with the parliamentary privileges. What are the privileges that the members of the parliament exercise and enjoy? And if you like this video, you can share it to your friends so that they can also benefit from this particular series, which will be immensely beneficial for the students appearing for 2024 UPSC examination and after. And if you want the PPT of this particular presentation, you can get it from my Telegram channel, Babuguna Shekharan 337. And you can also get in touch with me through my Instagram account, which is also Babuguna Shekharan 337. All right. Thank you very much. All the very best. God bless.